Hey everybody, good evening, whatever this is, how you doing? My name is Steve Armstrong with Story Equipment Sales. Uh, we are manufacturers, reps in this area. Uh, we concentrate mostly on the hydronic side of the business. Uh, we have my line card there with products that we represent. Uh, I've been with Story Equipment uh, 30 years. I remember. This year. You were in Brooklyn. We're in Brooklyn working Bill on the house basement. of Bill Story. That's yeah. right. Yeah, many people do remember that. Pick up pumps and we go out in the garage and pull them out of the Based garage. Four. They were. Yeah, so it was fine. And then when Bill retired, um, I asked him, I said, Bill, do we have to leave? Since you're retired, do we have to leave the basement? And then the guy, he said, yeah. I said, oh, shoot, now I got overhead. Um, <laughs> but but that was great. Bill's story was phenomenal. He was a, what I call the dark side of the business. He was very technical oriented. Now, he didn't use a calculator, he used a slide roll, and he did a lot of LMTDs, and heat transfer, heat exchangers, and stuff like that. He was very smart. Um, I hope I know a tenth of what he knew. I knew. He, was, he was very good. But what we're going to do today is talk about hydronics, and we're going to go back to the basics. Um, I find going back to the basics helps people. They do something, but they're not quite sure why they're doing it. We've been just joking around about pump discharge and uh, amp draws and stuff like that. And some people are joking about it, but a lot of people don't understand it. So what we're going to try to do is go back to the basics. If you have questions, I have 116 slides. Again, I could talk for a long time, but I'd rather we discuss things, okay, and come up with a, a solution together rather than me sit here and jabber. But let's get into it anyway. So even though the name of this presentation is Hydronic and Pump Basics, technology, it, technology is changing all the time. I'm going to have to <coughs> slow down because this is my first presentation since March because I haven't done in-person presentations and I got all this stuff going on, so I got to slow down some. I'm trying. But technology is changing all the time. You, you look behind you and you see these high efficiency boilers and everything else. So. Even though technology is changing, knowing the basic information actually becomes more important, more critical than it did when we had big old systems, big old boilers, high water content type things. So we're going to talk about pipe sizing. We're going to talk about where the pump should be. We're going to talk about expansion, air separation, dirt separation, some of those components in a hydronic system and why they're there. So, and it becomes, again, like I said, more critical now with, with the high efficiency stuff. Okay, so pipe size I find out to be one of the problems that I see a lot in going out in commercial and light commercial, even large commercial applications where pipe size is just not engineered correctly. Residentially, forget it. It's never a size problem, right? Do we always pipe a piece of equipment based on the connection of the equipment we're piping to? No. Very good. Good answer. We learned that a few months ago with the boiler. Yeah. Never, never size pipe based on the connection to the equipment. Size it based on the flow you want to get there. Because the manufacturer makes a certain connection at his piece of equipment to get the heat transfer or the velocity through his heat exchanger or his pump or something like that. I have commercial pumps that have a three inch suction and an inch and a half discharge on a three inch pipe system. It has nothing to do with what pipe size you're using. It's just the characteristics of that pump. So never pipe based on connection size, always base it on flow. So you need to understand what that flow is and where it belongs. So we're gonna talk about hydronics. Um, it's, it's probably near and dear to my heart because I sell a lot of products that are hydronic oriented. Um, I just want to point out a couple things here. Uh, comfort, energy efficiency, and energy savings. Now, uh, innovative in not invasive installation. I gotta slow down. And of course, flexibility. I feel that with hydronic systems, you have a lot of flexibility. Not invasive. I can carry the same amount of BTUs in a three-quarter inch pipe as I can in an eight inch by 14 inch duct. Okay, so from a design standpoint, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, um, hydronic heating is not a bad way to go. Flexibility, I can do a lot of things with one heat source. 
Here I have a, now this is a, a, a residence, but this could be a commercial building. It could be anything. A lot of things I talk about today look small. They're all small, hydronic, residential, but a pump's a pump. That pump could be, you know, 150 horsepower, six by six by 15. It's the same principle, centrifugal pumps. So we use those as samples. That's a lot easier to move around than it wasn't that big here in the, uh, in the conference room. But with one heat source, I can do a lot of things. I can take water into an indirect domestic hot water tank and produce domestic water. I can do radiant floor heating. I can do snow melt. I can circulate to baseboard or towel warmers. I can do, go through a heat exchanger and heat swimming pools and spots all from one heat source, okay? And what I look at, that, the way I look at that is those are opportunities that you can provide with a hydronic system. Any questions about the flexibility? Everybody agree? Okay, so we can change water temperatures within in that hydronic system. Some of the disadvantages of higher initial install costs. So a hydronic system could uh, typically, and that's why a lot of big home builders and even small commercial uh, strip malls and stuff like that have gone more HVAC than hydronic because of the initial cost. I wrote a fine competent contractors. You guys are here to learn about hydronics. Maybe Tom forced you to be here, but that's okay. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to want to know why you're here, but I appreciate you being here. We've had a couple of generations now that have not grown up and never seen hydronic systems. Who knows? Uh, obviously, do radiant. You've seen radiant. Anybody else do any radiant floor heat? Anybody live in a radiant place? Beautiful heat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. Because we're controlling the rate at which our bodies lose the heat, not heating air, and that makes us way more comfortable. We could do a whole class on radiant, and that would be nice to do someday. Do that. Some some basic fundamentals that we have to understand, and it, it works for everything we do on the hydronic side. Well, it works for HVAC as well. But temperature difference, heat flows from high temperature to low temperature. Okay, I don't know if you guys ever see any of the trade magazines, but Dennis the Menace or whatever is standing at the door, holding up the door, and <coughs> saying, "I can't remember. Does the heat cold come in or does the heat go out?" Okay, but hot goes to cold, always. And that's a principle we use, and that's how we, why we use radiation and do things in, our, in a hydronic side. And water flows from high pressure to low pressure, okay? So those are two principles that we do in hydronics that we follow, and it's not something we can change. So my dad, no, no I'm just kidding. Uh, Mr. Fahrenheit, who created or discovered BTUs, or what we call British thermal units, um, that's what we, we deal with in, in our business, BTUs, British thermal units. But basically what it is is the amount of heat added to one pound of water, one pound of water, that atmospheric pressure to raise the temperature one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, that's what a BTU is. And we refer to BTUs when we size boilers and furnaces and all the equipment that we deal with today. And one pint weighs 1.04375 pounds. One gallon of water, everybody know what one gallon of water weighs? 8.33. Oh man, why am I teaching this? Oh, I am you guys. 8.33, you're absolutely right. And that's part of an equation when we come to calculating our gallons per minute. How many gallons in a cubic foot? Two. Very good there. That's 8 point something too, isn't it? <laughs> so when we talk about heat, we talk about a couple ways of dispersing heat, convection, conduction, and radiation, okay? And this is what basic a radiator would look like when we have it. Does a radiator only heat with radiation? Absolutely not. It also needs convection. So we have, as we heat air, it becomes less dense. It becomes lighter. It goes up to the top. And as the air cools, it drops down and we create the convection and we take the heat away from that radiator. Conduction is you touch that hot spot, and you're transferring heat, okay? Transferring heat, always hot, goes to cold. 
Radiation, same thing. It's a hot surface radiating out to a cold surface. So a cast iron radiator does all three, uses all three methods of transferring heat. How about a piece of baseboard? This is one of my favorite slides because, and, and Tom and I were talking about it earlier, um, how many times do you go into a, an in, uh, a, a commercial building or a residence or something and they complain, they know this room's always cold. I can never get enough heat out of this room. And you walk in and the bed and the dresser and the nightstand are covering all the radiation, right? Or the cubicle farm wall. Yeah. It's right up against it. Right up against it. Yes, sir. At Trunco, they uh, put a new carpet in the woman's and office. They, they put the carpet right up there and blocked it off. Blocked it off. Walked in five minutes to 12 and he says, uh, I know what's wrong. Come back after lunch. It'll be fixed. Mm -hmm. What'd you do? Never mind. It's Never mind. Cut the carpet off. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we see it all the time. We need that convection. We need that air coming up to take that heat and transfer it out. And again, the vent or the uh, the, uh, the damper on a radiation go out there and see that, and that's closed, and they complain that they don't have any. You know, they don't get the room up to temperature. So there's a lot of things that we have to be aware of, and I tell people all the time. Slide your bed out of there, pull your dresser, put it on a dip. I don't like it there. Well, then freeze. I, I, can't, I, I can't help you. <laughs> we can put more radiation all over the place if you want. But, uh, it's radium chloride. Yeah, that, that's perfect. But radium fluoride has its problems too. What if you put the wrong carpet and pan on? Okay, so now I've got heat. So, oh, the best big house in uh, Wade Hill. Beautiful, big old family room. <clears throat> Beautiful hardwood floors, and they said we cannot get this room up to you know any higher than 62 degrees. We crank it up to 80. We can't get it there. I'm going. Hmm, doesn't make sense. So we walked into the room. This table had to be. Yeah, it had to have been almost as long as this room. Big old wood table. And I'm going. Oh, that's a gorgeous table. But really wasn't looking at the table. I was looking at the ornamental rug that was underneath the table. And it ran. There was about a foot. All the way around the room. Of, of, of wood of, of the floor. Yeah. And I had said, let's try something. Picked up the corner of the rug, and the, you could just feel the heat coming off of this thing. It's just, you're, you're covering up your radiator. You're hiding the heat from going out. You're insulating it. So being able to get heat out is very important, okay? Because if we don't get the heat out, it's going back to the boiler, and the boiler's going to go out on limit, even though there's cost for heat. Because it's not dissipating the heat. So we have to get rid of those BTUs, and that's what we're trying to do. So a very basic, simple hydraulic system. We have a heat source. We have distribution, which is our piping. We have air separation. Why do we need air separation in a hot water heating system? Because air blocks flow and causes more corrosion. Where does air come air from? Air doesn't do anything good for us at all. There's an insulator, right? It comes in and it forms dissolved. Boils out, out, out of the water. water. Boils out of the water. As we heat water, we drive air out of solution. The best example of that is if you take a pot of spaghetti, you put one, you put water on the stove, right? Crystal clear when you pour it into, put it into the pan. Turn the heat on. A few minutes later, it starts to get a little bit foggy. What is that? That's air being driven out of solution. Then it starts to boil, okay? And you're driving a lot of air out of solution. But every time we heat water, we raise the temperature of water, we start to drive oxygen out of solution. So we want to get rid of air. As they said, there's an insulator. We're trying to transfer heat. If it's an insulator, that's not good, okay? So we want the air out of, out, out of systems. Older hydraulic systems used um, air purgers with a vent on them, and then they used a standard expansion tank where we needed to captivate some of that air to get it back up into the expansion tank so that we didn't lose the charge of the expansion tank. How many have had to drain standard expansion tanks down because they waterlogged, right? Water and air have a great affinity for each other. They absorb and be removed as you heat and cool water. So we want to get the air out. Why is not good, frankly? This black ferrous oxide stuff that we drained out of the system, it's because there was air in the system. It's the deterioration or the decaying of the system is really what it is. And that's caused a lot by air, mostly by air. So the air separator is important. 
we have a pump. We need to circulate or create a differential in the system to move water. So what do you think a circulating pump does based on our two fundamentals? It's not transferring heat, right? But it is creating a pressure differential. So a pump is not really pushing water, it's actually creating a negative pressure at the suction side and the higher pressure water is filling that void. That's what a centrifugal pump is actually doing. It's creating a negative pressure and it comes in. And all pumps have a differential they have to operate at. We can operate and it added pressure to the system or we can operate that pump where it's always pulling a negative. And that's the location of where that pump is. And it's away from the point of no pressure change, which is where the expansion tank is. We could literally probably do an hour on why that is, but trust me, I'm a salesman. Believe me. Right? Now, we'll talk about the expansion tank and the pump location a little bit later. So we have heat distribution emitters. I don't care if it's radium floor, if it's baseboard, if it's cast iron radiators, if it's a, a coil in a fan, an air handle, or anything. Okay, We're, we have to get rid of that heat and our distribution system back. Anybody under, know what this is? Fill uh, system water fill supply. Anybody know why we have that? In a, in a hydraulic system. So you're not really going to typically fill a building with just a fill line, okay? You're going to find other ways, or you're going to put a bypass in across the PRV. It's called a pressure reducing valve or fill valve, and that's there just to maintain pressure in the system so that when we do vent air out and we drop in pressure, that fill valve just maintains that, that pressure <coughs> that we have set for. And does anybody know what pressure that should be in a system? 12 times. Residentially, yes. Okay. Residentially, up to three stories, yes. Anything higher than that, our fill pressure may be higher. Okay. So for every floor, you have a certain height you have to get that water to. It's a fill valve. So the idea is, is as you turn the fill valve on, you have enough pressure to get it all the way to the top of the building and about two to five pounds extra at the top. That's what the fill valve does. The original fill valves were designed strictly for one person to fill and vent a hydraulic system. They were actually not intended to be left on all the time. Anybody knew that? Early on instructions, the fill valve actually said, fill your system, vent it, run it, and then isolate the fill valve. Why would you do that? No new water. There's no new water in case there's a leak. Along with the air. That, that valve doesn't know if there if it's less than 12 pounds, and that's what it's set for. Going, right? It's gonna go and go and go and go until who knows when somebody finds it. Plus they also tend to be, along with all the air coming in with our fresh water, we also got minerals that could build up in Minerals, there. chemicals, and, and oxygen. Then it three sticks, things that come in every time we have water. Then it sticks open, then you're always lifting the relief. Or it sticks shut and you do have air bubble or a leak and now you're not filling. So unfortunately in the industry, we, we leave them on. I'm not telling you to turn them off, but just know what the purpose of that fill valve is, okay? So for every 2.31 feet, there's one PSI, okay? So for every 2.31 feet of height, we have one PSI water column. We'll see a slide in a minute. So when we know it's a 100 foot building, okay, we have 100 feet divided by 2.31, okay? So we need that PSI to get to the top and add a couple extra for, for getting the air out of the system at the jockey point. Yeah, but it's amazing how many engineers design circulating pumps because of the height of the building. It has nothing to do with the size of a circulating pump. We'll talk about that in a minute. Not a closed loop. Man, you're taking all my stuff. <laughs> you're right, but why? Because the downward force of the return bar is just negative. Oh, <laughs> evens out. So whatever goes up, it goes down. So water is a non-compressible, okay? So once water starts to move in a system, it all has to move. And he's absolutely right. It's like a Ferris wheel. 
Has anybody ever looked at the motor of a Ferris wheel? They're not very big. They put people on it, and that's why they alternate people on a Ferris wheel if, they're not, if it's not full. They alternate it so that they get momentum. Because once you start to move, everything starts to move and then rotates. Very small little motors on, on uh, very, um, Ferris wheels. But that's exactly what happens in a hydronic system. Once we start moving water, whatever goes up also comes down and it circulates. Very good. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, again, I look at this slide because I sell hydronics or even you guys as contractors. This should be opportunities. I mean, if you understand hydronics, look at all the stuff that can go wrong. It's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Scratch uh, that. No, there's a lot. There's a lot of things to, cool. that are in a hydronic system. A lot, a lot of opportunities. Opportunities. It's, it's opportunities, right? We got pumps. We got check valves. We got air separators. We got fill valves. We got indirect tanks. We got controls. We can inject. We talked about different water temperatures. This water coming out of the boiler might be 180. These might be radiant loops. We're doing an injection loop, and we're maintaining a much cooler water temperature in a radiant heating site. You did, Kevin, you did, did your what, parents' house with it? Same thing. Injection pumping is really nice. You don't need a temporary valve. Pumps are relatively inexpensive compared to some, some uh, tempering valves. And a lot of guys carry a little circulator on their truck. They can replace it any time. But what we're doing is we're just injecting this higher water temperature into here, mixing with the uh, cooler water coming back from the return and maintaining a lower temperature. I could have 180 degree water temperature in his main and run this at 90 degrees. By controlling the speed of this pump and just injecting with what that needs. That's a control, but certainly simple to do. Okay. And we sell more pumps, and I sell pumps. So that's all good. We like injection pumps. <laughs> I'm sorry, it gets switch. <laughs> what kind of variable speed pump is that? Is that a cartridge pump? So, so the, with, with this happened to be a, a variable speed, tough bar, variable speed injection control. Just a little wet rotor circulator. As long as it's. Oh, it's just bringing rotor. voltage to vary speed? Yeah. It? yeah. It's kind of pulsing the voltage in and slowing it down and speeding it up based on a sensor, which is telling it, I want this water temperature. Compared to the outdoor sensor. Yeah. And that's you can't outdoor. just change voltage, you have to change frequency. Yeah. So, injection pumping is a neat way. We can do that with water. There's a lot of different things, again, we can do with water that we may not be able to do with heating. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into uh, my soapbox here is, I also sell boilers. And when we replace boilers, I don't care residentially, commercially, whatever it is, how do we replace boilers? Because the boiler size, the BTUs, remember Fahrenheit over there? The BTUs we have to provide to that system determines everything else in the system. It determines the amount of radiation, it determines pipe size, it determines pump size, it determines everything. But how do we replace boilers today? Let's talk about You look at the BTU rating and they swap it out with a high efficiency. <laughs> I like that. But why are you yeah. doing that? No, but, but, but I hear that a lot. And they say, and they say that's what we want to do because it's got a 10 to 1 turn down on it. It's much more forgiving. I'm going to tell you it's more critical to size a condensing boiler than it was the old boilers. Because now I've got blowers, I've got sensors, I've got controls, I've got all kinds of things, and what kills anything? Cycle rates. You oversize a condensing boiler, you're still going to short cycle it. And there's less water content, so they cycle a lot more than even a regular boiler. So I still say that I would rather undersize a condensing boiler than oversize a condensing boiler, and we'll talk about it. We're going to talk about a lot. We're going to be here for four hours. Okay. Okay. Um, so selecting the boiler is critical when we talk about hydronics because it relates to everything. So what are the methods we use for selecting boilers? It's about yay big and it'll fit here. <laughs> That's one. And the bigger the, the bigger, bigger the, the better, right? The bigger the better because you get paid by a percentage of what you sell. 
But Mrs. Jones also says if you came in and gave her a price on a 100,000 BTU boiler in her house and an 80,000, you did the heat loss, all she needs is 60,000 BTUs. What is she going to say? I want the 100,000 BTUs because I want to make sure I got enough heat. Hear it all the time. How much can you afford? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I can put it, if, if it doesn't matter. It, if, if my heat loss at design temperature is 60,000 BTUs, you put a 300,000 BTU boiler in there, it's not going to deliver 300,000 BTUs. It can't. So what does it do? Short cycles. It can only deliver 60,000 BTUs. If it's I know you're being sarcastic. If it's cast iron and it's big enough, <laughs> and, and you undersize the pump enough, you can crack boiler sections repeatedly year after year. But if you put a big enough pump on, you can heat the neighbor's house you know, <laughs> and charge them a lot of money. So, so yeah, boiler, boiler selection, we do a lot of weird things. And the most common is probably what was in there before, if it's a replacement boiler, right? There's a 250,000 BTU boiler in there, that's what I'm putting back in. Yeah, it makes my head hurt. Yeah. Uh. Um, yeah, it does mine too. See, if you oversize the boiler, then you just have to sell a storage tank, and then you can trap all that heat there. So, buffer. Or a buffer tank. Buffer yes, tank. Let's me. use the right terminology. But you're absolutely right. Putting an oversized boiler, and that's what we do sometimes when they spend a lot of money in a condensing boiler and it's oversized, we got to go in and put a buffer tank in. So now we got this big volume of water that we're heating and we're storing it and we're waiting for those zones to call. Boiler may not have to come on, but that buffer tank may satisfy zones. We do that by design sometimes when we have small micro zones and we, we need, you know, we don't want to cycle the boiler every time it comes on, so we do a buffer tank, but that's, that's okay. great. Get that fly wheel effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the boilerplate method, probably the most common. Radiation count. How many say, I'm gonna go through the building and count my, my feet of radiation? We do it, right? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna ask you to do that, but I'm gonna ask you also to do a heat loss. And I'm gonna show you why. Counting radiation doesn't mean the size of the water. It means what water temperature is gonna need, you're gonna to need to satisfy the heat load. So counting radiation really doesn't mean much for us. Now, in steam, it's the only way to size a boiler. You have to count radiation. Because the boiler, the steam boiler, has to make steam, fill the piping, fill the radiation, build up pressure, and then shut off. It doesn't care if there's enough radiation to satisfy thermostats or anything else. It just fills up the pipe, fills up the radiation, builds up pressure, shuts off. If there's a still a call for heat, it goes through that same cycle again. If you oversize a steam boiler, what happens? It fills it up fast, it shuts off. Yep, short cycles. Only. Short cycles. What if you undersize a steam boiler? Runs and runs and runs and never makes never enough sat, pressure. Never, never, never makes you, enough steam. Works, never works okay till you really need it because it's cold, really cold out. Well, yeah, a lot of times those problems, and, and we'll talk about hydronics too, a lot of times the problems by undersizing or changing a pump and maybe putting the wrong pump in, don't have, don't, you don't see the problem in the shoulder weather, you only see it when it's really, really cold. And who wants to go out when it's really, really cold? Well, you guys do, because make more money that way. <laughs> okay, so radiation count. I'm gonna ask you to do radiation count, but don't size your boiler based on radiation count. The cutout method. I just happened to revise my cutout uh, method yeah, here. Good one. Right? So what you do, you step across the street, and I even have it marked. On the curve. Six section. Four section, five section. You stand across the street, and if the house fits in this one, <laughs> that's a four section boiler. We laugh, but there are people that size boilers this way. Okay? Is this the best way to do it? No. <laughs> they make a boiler for uh, condensing units too. Yeah. Yeah. Like a three ton, it, a four ton, a five ton. Yeah. Do they? Same thing? No, yeah. same thing. I've seen it. It's, it's, They're shaped different. It's a joke. Yeah. 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 I knew that, but it, not my. This is my kind. Oh, this, okay. is, this is my design. Right 
They better not be copying me. <laughs> we also have the I did one like this before method. Does that, does a house next door to each other or a building next door to you because they're the same height, the same width, the same length, do they have the same heat loss? Not necessarily. What about uh, That was the method I used to use for picking up women in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> now I would say that would be at the top of the list. <laughs> I needed one of those cutouts. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so, so this might be early evening, middle evening, late evening. Yeah, yeah. Well, this the last call. Last call. Gotcha. Last call. Yeah. That's the last well, you call. You don't get call. to that one now because it's cut last calls at 10 o'clock still. So. Oh, that's yeah. right. You know, so, so, really so you still right. may be up in here for yeah. the last call now. Back in the day. Yeah. Oh, you guys are bad. Yeah. There's also the whatever I have in stock method. Now, that comes from the distribution side. Okay, you walk in and say, I need 100,000 BTU bar. He says, no, nope, closest thing I got is a 140. Well, oh, I'll usually, take that one. Usually comes with a comment like, it should work. It should, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then it's, of course, the best of the scientific wild ass guess method. The swag method, and that, that, quite honestly, that's the way a lot of boilers are selected. I gave you a little book called The Heating Helper. It's uh, by U.S. Boiler Burnham, um, and I don't know if my page number is right, but there's page 70 to 80 somewhere, or 75 on this one, it is a quick heat loss. And remember, heat loss is hot going to cold, and the... Temperature difference is the driving force for heat loss. So do I have the same heat loss if it's 70 degrees inside and 50 degrees outside? No. No. Do I have a higher heat loss if it's 70 degrees inside and zero degrees outside? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to talk about why that's important when we talk about condensing boilers and modulating water temperatures, but heat loss is important. This is a quick method of doing the envelope of a building or a house. This is really more designed for residential applications. They have all kinds of fancy heat loss programs, right? You guys, I don't know what you guys use, but there's a lot of different programs that are out there. Stop laughing, I saw that. <laughs> we use it, huh? we you blend, use this one? We blend. All yeah, of those at least four, four of the other of methods, methods usually your trouble. That's pretty good. Uh, uh, Tom. That? <laughs> 76, page 76. But there's also a, an example with that on, e, on, on the page after, I think. Yeah. So it kind of tells you, but you're looking at the envelope of the house and you're trying to figure out the, the rate of heat and the heat loss. And it doesn't matter what size boiler you put in. The heat loss is the heat loss, plain and simple. The only way to change the heat loss is what? Insulate the walls. Put more insulation in the ceiling. Move the house. Put windows. Don't Go heat to the Florida. House up. Don't yeah. heat the house up so high. Uh, there, yeah. that, would do, that, that changes it. Yep, yep, that changes it. 50 outside, you or, the house to or, or dump a lot of Freon and we'll increase global warming. Rent the Eskimos. Yeah. They don't need no, They don't care. <laughs> they live in ice. Ice houses. So let's take a, a, a reason why we might want to do this. Um, and I'm going to compare this with the count radiation idea. So let's say we have a house. Um, we count the, square, the lineal feet of radiation, and there's 175 feet of baseboard, right? OK. At 180 degrees, this is the baseboard rating. At 180 degrees, we're getting 590 BTUs per lineal foot of baseboard. Right? Mm -hmm. 590 BTUs Fahrenheit. Remember that guy? His BTUs come up a lot. So if we multiply that out, we got 175 feet times 590. We need 103,000 BTUs for the house if we size it based on radiation. But again, radiation doesn't determine what the heat loss is. Is BTUs per hour or a minute? Per hour. Per hour. Per hour. Important. Very important. Oh my God. Very important. And when we refer to BTUs, we always do it in hours. And in our, but it doesn't always get said. In our pump equation, we have to convert 
hours and minutes because we're talking about GPM, which is in minutes. You're gonna get a pound. And BTUs in hours. That, that, that's where all that math comes in. You wait. That one. You're, I'm calling on you to do it too. So, <laughs> so we got 103,000 BTUs that we need. So what do we do? We go to the wholesaler and we say we need 103,000 BTU net output, and he goes. Okay, well, that's 120,000 BTU boiler, or 130,000 BTU boiler. I have 150,000. Okay, we'll take the 150,000. See how things get blown out of proportion? Really, boilers in this area are between 50 and 200% oversized. 50 to 200% oversized. Grossly oversized. Because people have that mentality, which I did too. A bigger boiler is going to give you more heat, right? Until I learned that, no, it doesn't. It doesn't give you any more heat. So we got, we got this equation. Now we do a heat loss. We find out that the heat loss of that house is 71,000 BTUs. And did you know that this side of the Mississippi, the average heat loss residentially is about 70 to 75,000 BTUs? That's all it is. Average. Some houses What's the are average size house? Much bigger. 2,000 square foot? 1,500 square foot? Between, probably between 1,500 and 2,200. Yeah. 2, square foot. Yeah. Yep. And most of it is, is that. Now, this is with the idea that um, I, I'm talking more for, um, after, say, 1960, 1970 vintage, okay? Because... Um, Earlier houses had no insulation and their heat losses were pretty high. But most houses had new construction that were a little bit tighter, okay? So houses are a little bit tighter. But do a heat loss. Find out what the, what the insulation is in the house. It's important. So we do the heat loss. We find out we got 71,000 BTUs. If we put that 130,000 BTU boiler in, do, are we going to get any more output than 71,000? No, we're not. But what it does allow us to do, and if we make the calculation backwards, all we needed to heat this house at design was 120 feet of baseboard. So we're not going to pull baseboard out. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what we can do is now we're talking about, do I go in with a standard efficient boiler or do I go in with a high efficiency boiler? Because high efficiency boilers work on lower water temperature. Return. Yeah. Return water temperature. Well, if you start it, off low, it you're might, going to come back lower. It too. might depend on how that baseboard is laid out. It's one continuous loop. You can end up with yeah. Rooms at the end. Well, yeah. Well, but it, you're going to have a high delta T through that loop, whether it's a right. cast iron Which boiler. Which is what we want. Do we? I'm, well, we, we I'm, want I'm, a cold return I'm, if we're going to go high efficiency. If we're going to go high efficiency. But I, I don't want a high delta T in my loop, and I'll tell you why. Yeah, so, but, so now we do that calculation. Now we say 71,000 BTUs. We have 175 feet of baseboard. All I need is 405 BTUs per lineal foot now to satisfy the heat loss. Okay, what water temperature do I need now? At design, if it were zero, and we designed this around zero, and that's our heat loss, my maximum water temperature will be 150 to 155, not 180, which is what we're running right now, whether it's 60 outside or zero outside. Okay, so this is where we get the efficiencies. This is why I say do a heat loss and count radiation, because now you can go to Mrs. Jones and say, I've got two offers for you. I've got a cast iron 80% efficient boiler at say 90,000 BT, whatever that 20% that loss is. Let's call it 100,000, that's a little bit high. So 90,000 BT boiler, or I'm coming in with a condensing boiler at 80,000 BTUs, okay, which is can be 95% efficient. So Mrs. Jones is gonna say, but I have 140 to 30,000 BT boiler in there now. She doesn't understand this concept. If you don't understand it, it's hard to explain. So we say, Mrs. Jones, you have this much radiation. Because you're over-radiated, it might be justifiable to go on a high-efficiency boiler because now you're going to see that 95% efficiency. If I can't 
run my water temperatures down and I put a high efficient boiler in there, am I gonna see 95% efficiency? No. No. What is efficiency? When they cause say the boiler is 95% efficient, what is it? Does anybody know? Gas fired appliances, basically efficiency is how much heat you're getting out of it and how much you're throwing up the chimney. Mm -hmm. AFUE, annual fuel utilization efficiency is what they rate boilers in. How many BTUs of gas you bought, how many BTUs went in your house? Yeah, yeah. So, good question. AFUE, oh, go ahead. Do you design for zero or cold to stay on record? Well, well not cold to stay on record. Huh? No, never, never, ne I would never do it. That's going to grossly oversize the boiler. Cleveland was 20, 19 below zero. Right. Yeah, it's 29. So, ASHRAE has a number and it, Right now, I think it's at eight. I think my slide says six in a second here, but eight is, is ASHRAE, what ASHRAE says our design temperature is. I do use zero, okay? But I've got reasons why I use zero. I use zero for my design, but when I set my parameters on my boiler, I consider my lowest day temperature of 20 degrees. So I've got my highest water temperature out of my boiler. By the, time you're, by the time you're down to 20, you get your highest. Yeah, but it should so only I'm not be, waiting till shoot. But it should only be 155 in this case. Right? Yeah, but yeah. the weather, weather stuff can say uh, zero or 1%, 2.5% or 5%. Mm -hmm. So 5%, 95% of the time it's uh, no it's warmer than this. So, so when we do radiant, we do snow melt. We do a lot of snow melt sizing based on a percentage like that. 100% snow melt all the time, you know, and then we have ratings done like that. Um, and, and yeah, they do it, but typically, most people aren't gonna do all that math. They're just gonna pick a number, whether it's zero or 10 or 20 and do their heat loss. And, and, and guys, what I like to do is, I actually like to do a heat loss at my design temperature of say zero, also, I'd like to do a heat loss at 60 degrees outside. Because I still might get a call for heat. Now I'll know what my minimum firing rate needs to be with that boiler. So I know the range. I'm going to be able to take care of the worst case scenario, but I don't want it short cycling in the best case scenario. I don't know which, if that's the right term to use for <laughs> those two figures. But do you get what I'm saying? All right, so we talked about that would be why we would do condensing. Now we're going to go back and say, what are, what are the typical, typical, slow down, Steve, typical types of boilers we see today? Right now, you know, we see cast iron technology. Um, commercially, we see fire tube, we see water tube, we see different types there, but we're seeing a lot more on the condensing side. Condensing, high efficiency, meaning we're condensing the flue gases that are going up through the heat exchanger. Modcon. Modcon, modulating, condensing boiler. And what we're doing by condensing the flue gases, we're adding about 10% more energy to that water. So we're going to from like an 85 to a 95% by condensing. But we only condense when we bring back low return water temperatures. And the lower, the more efficient. How low? How low can we go? Let's see. We're going to see that in a minute. So, okay, well, we'll talk about it because it came up. Condensing, well, flue gas condenses about at 135 degrees. Okay, so if our water temperature is coming back at 135, we're going to start condensing flue gases. A cast iron boiler, stop, freeze that thought. When we talked about AFUE, Right? Annual fuel utilization efficiency. Boilers are tested to get their efficiency going out at 140, coming back at 120. That's how boilers are tested for AFUE. Can a cast iron boiler operate in those temperatures? No. They, that's condensing. So a cast iron boiler at those temperatures would actually condense the flue gases. And we've probably all seen cast iron or steel type boilers that are condensing. The, the flue pipe is eaten away. It's got white crusty stuff all over. There's holes in it. It drips down onto the, the burners. They're all beat up. The cast iron looks horrible. You know one, right away that's I found one firing at four inches. 
of crud on the bottom. Of rust sand on top of the burn. <laughs> I believe gas it. would just bubble up through it and just dance across. Because somebody probably heard, hey, if I lower my water temperature, I'm going to get more efficiency yeah. out of it. Well, in a cast iron boiler, it's not made for that. It's going to cause trouble. Okay, so <clears throat> AFU, we wanted to get there. There was another thought I told you to hold, but I forgot what it was. But anyway, we, we talked about distribution. We have our boiler. We talked about boilers for a few minutes. Now we have distribution. We have piping. This is our series loop. Series loop is a very simple way to go. Uh, and this is the way originally the old guys put in hydronic systems. But there's an inherent problem here. What if I wanted to zone Betty Lou's bedroom back here? can. If I put a valve in here and I shut it off, I shut the flow off to the whole system, right? So the old guys were pretty smart. What they did was they designed monoflow tubes. A monoflow tube. One pipe tube. Exactly. So now they have a main that flows through here back to the boiler. One of the other fundamentals about Water is, water wants to flow to the path of least resistance, okay? So, and people are the same way, I think. You know, we all want to follow the path of least resistance, right? Who wants to go the hard road? But this is a, a monoflow or a one-pipe T, and what we're doing is we're circulating in a larger pipe in a main, and then we're creating a pressure drop. And as the water comes here and slows down, it forces water up and into the radiation. And then it meets and goes back through here. It does the same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. Now, Betty Lou's bedroom can be isolated. So the old guys came up with monoflow tees. Now, when I first started in the business, some of the distributors had rows and rows and rows of monoflow tees. They had them in cast iron. They had supply model flow, they had return model flow, they had them in copper, they had them all over. You're lucky to find model flow tees anymore. Matter of fact, I better get that one back. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, water wants to flow to the path of least resistance. So by creating this resistance, we push the water up and we circulate through the thing. Kind of pretty neat, I mean, I think. It doesn't look like a lot, but it's enough resistance to slow that water down and force it up into the... Until an untrained plumber fixes the leak by going out of Home Depot and putting a regular tube. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. the, well the, rest again, of the, the rest of the room, the rest of the house works, but that room makes Exactly. So if you if you go to a job and it is a minor flow system, and you'll know because there's a main that runs all the way around, everything branches off of it, okay? Branches off of it. Supplies and returns branches off of it. So if you go to that job and back here there is a leak in that elbow and you replace it, or that T, and you replace it with a standard T, by the time you load your tools in the truck and start driving down the road, Mrs. Jones is going to call you and say, hey, thanks for fixing the leak, but now we have no heat in the room. <laughs> you're going to say, all I did was replace the T, right? So the, I spend a little bit of time on this because there's a lot of people that don't understand this and don't realize this. Steve. If I had radiation going down, I might have two monoflow T's in that supply and a return. I built a vacuum system for a steam job with a monoflow T. Moving, what, what was that, Mike? Was that 10 gallons? Oh, ten, 10 gallons a minute through a three-quarter pipe. A plastic pump, and we're drawing... Out of that T, out of that branch, we were sucking 45 inches of water. Wow. Okay, so it, the way this works is amazing when you think about it. You're forcing water through the main part of the T. You're sucking water back through the branch. And I just, I was astounded at how, how, works. how, how much that's a fancy vacuum. I've seen them. Ah, this is this, some of them are just a bath. Just like yeah. an Just yeah, a bath. Like half bath oh, yeah. That's an old one. That's an older style. That's what they, that's the original monoflow tea. Never, Never seen, seen one like that. that. Yeah. That's a nice one. That's why I said I want it back. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching you. I'm bad watching you. <laughs> so yeah, that tea is important. And, uh, you know, monoflow teas were used for a lot of different things, and this is just kind of what happens as the flow goes in there. It slows it down, 
It creates that diversion. And as Tom said, as we as we increase the velocity through this orifice, it's actually pulling that water through as well. Huh. So it's a pretty unique uh, way to do it. Would you call that a diverter T? Yes. You can call it whatever you want. Inverter T. Diver. Diverter. Yeah, because you're diverting the flow. That's a, it's, it's a good way to call it. So, so monoflow was a, a term um, by uh, the other red pump company, um, you know, Bell and Gossett. And, and Armstrong used what they call a one pipe T. So it's, it's just their name. <laughs> You like that one? Or <laughs> All right. And then this is probably more what we see today. The Mexican world. version. We see boilers. We see uh, zones. Okay, coming off. We might have zone valves. We might be zoning with pumps, which is what I prefer. Because I sell pumps, remember? <laughs> but we've, we've got multiple. So residentially, this may be uh, a, a second floor, a first floor, and a basement zone system. Okay, thermostat on each floor, controlling the zone valve. When there's a call for heat, the end switch makes, turns the boiler on. This pump turns on no matter what zone calls, depends on what, what zone valve's open. Does the zone valve have to be on the return? No, it can be on the supply. It can be anywhere you want. Does the pump have to be on the supply? Yes. Oh, I love you. That's an awesome answer. Yes. <clears throat> I'm so it tell depends you. on where the, the uh, expansion tank is. Yes, exactly. You could have pump it into the boiler. You could, but remember now the, the differential of the pump, the outlet of that pump is adding pressure. So what if your what if your boiler is a 30 pound relief and you've got 20 pounds in the system and you right. turn that pump on, you could pop relief valves. Right. And you're saying, what am I, why am I popping a relief valve every time the pump turns on? Because you're adding that pressure to the system. So just be aware of it. You're right. The point of no pressure change is where we tie the expansion tank in, and that's the reference point where we want to pump away. Again, we can spend a lot of time on why. I actually have a pretty cool video where a guy built a system, valves and gauges and expansion tank, and it's a really cool way to do it. If you want to, after this, we can, I can show it to you. I just can't figure out how to do it while it's in the presentation because I'm not technically savvy. Um, but it's pretty cool. But again, trust me, I'm a salesman. Pump away from the point of no pressure change. You're always going to be better off. Because a pump differential, if I'm pumping into the boiler, okay, and the expansion tanks here, my only increase in pressure that pump is producing is from where that pump is on the return, pumping into this point. The rest of the differential the pump is producing is a negative pressure. So on the third floor, that automatic air vent you put on because you're constantly getting air on the third floor, that hissing you here may not be venting air, it might be sucking air in. And we've seen it, we've seen it. So always pump supply. Because usually, when I, I say supply, but I really mean away from the point of no pressure change. You're always going to be better off. Yeah, pumps, you're, if you're, it's open seal, that's another place where air gets sucked in a lot. Yeah. Especially if you don't have your expansion tank on the suction side. On the suction side, right. And when we, when we use the pump head to increase pressure into the system, we collapse air bubbles. And the idea of getting the air bubble back through the system and back to the air separator is what we're trying to do. Okay, so we collapse it. If we're, if we're lowering the pressure, not only does the air come out of solution when we heat it, but also when we drop in pressure. When we open up that Diet Coke uh, bottle, what happens? We're lowering the pressure, right? And then all those bubbles start coming out of the top. That's the same principle. We remove air when we low pressure. So highest heat, lowest pressure. If you put the air separator on the suction side of the pump, guess what? On the outlet of the boiler, you're at the highest water temperature and you're at your lowest pressure. That's the best place to put it. So there's some other piping methods. I throw this one in there because we're going to talk a little bit about primary secondary piping. And when primary secondary piping first came out, it was closely spaced T's, right? 
That's what primary secondary is, and we'll, we'll talk about it. But what we did was we did this. We think, now I can control these zones, I can put pumps on them, and we got a, a great way of circulating zones individually, primary, secondary. The trouble is, is in this type of piping arrangement, as I bring my water in here and I take water up through this and come back, what is it doing at this point? Mm -hmm. It's tempering water. So by the time I get to this last zone, I may not have enough temperature to satisfy that zone. Now, if you were smart and designed it that way, and that was a garage loop or a radiant loop or something like that, you can design it and do it that way. Okay. You, you could correct that by increasing your pipe size and pump flow in your primary loop. You could, but you're still, you're still bringing return water. The correct way really to do it is this. Okay, do primary secondary on the boiler loop, and then this manifold, supply manifold, is all the same temperature, all the time. Okay, because I'm not tempering it over here. So you've got what, a control valve and a balancing valve? Um, that's a zone valve, that's a zone valve, and these are, this is my system pump. And then this is another pump in here. What are those um, other valves for balancing? Uh, gate valves looks like, I don't know. Isolation. <laughs> yeah, just isolate. Purge valves. Purge isolation yeah. valves. I don't know. But these are these are zone valves. So yeah, you you want a the way a way to isolate each zone anyway. I'd have them on the return too, but um, but this is just showing you when we first started introducing primary secondary that we kind of did it and it worked, but it didn't work exactly as what we thought it was going to work. Okay. Um, but that's how we pipe standard everyday cast iron sectional boilers, 80% efficient. Series loop, monoflow systems, zones, right? Okay, it's pretty simple. One pump circulating all through. Well, so cast iron section. We had uh, nipples that are cast iron sections are pushed together. Yes. Um, the, the ribbon burners are down below on a base. The flue gases come up through the sections. All those little nubs transfer the heat, they give them surface area to take the heat out of the flue gases, and then the flue gases go up into a uh, um, draft diverter or a canopy, and then out through, through the flue, right? That's how we transferred our heat. Again, hot goes to cold, so we're heating up the water with those high temperature flue gases. But now we introduce condensing boilers. And we have to pipe them a little bit differently. Why? Anybody want to guess why? So water capacity. Capacity, second, pressure drop, one. They have a much higher pressure drop. So the manufacturers of condensing boilers, these types of heat exchangers, this is what we call a water tube heat exchanger. Water goes in through this manifold, goes through the tubes, and then out the outside manifold. This is a fire tube design. We fire down through the tubes. The flue gases are going down or elements of combustion in the tubes. The water comes in the bottom of the shell, goes through some baffles and out. Two different types of heat exchangers we're using with condensing pressure. Basically, there are other variations of this. High pressure drop. This one, not as much. Not as much of a pressure drop. But, and then this one also has a higher water content than these. But that's why we do primary secondary piping with condensed product because we need to make sure because of the very low water content that Tom said there's a there's a Giannone style or Cermenta style heat exchanger back there. That's the water tube right here. Okay? They have a high pressure drop. So we do primary secondary piping to make sure we got the minimum, at least the minimum amount of flow going through the heat exchanger. So we don't burn it up because it's a teacup of water in there, guys. It's not a lot of water, like an old, big old cast iron sectional. So we do primary, secondary piping to make sure we've got constant flow or the right flow going through the boiler. So like I said, different heat exchangers, different systems, different efficiencies, different piping. That one kind of looks just like that one, doesn't it? Yeah, this is the fire tube here. And then that's the fire tube design, yeah. right? So you're firing down through the tubes. It gets halfway down. The water, cooler water's coming in. It starts to condense at that point. 
the condensation then drops down into a trap and then goes through your um, condensate neutralizer. I recommend the condensate neutralizer on all condensing products because it's very acidic. Always put a condensate neutralizer on it. But here, somebody asked the question earlier, where, where, do we, where do we start the, where's our dew point? Where do we start to condense? And we, it's at 35 degrees is the dew point, and you'll see it's somewhere in that 135 degree water temperature. The flu temperature and the water temperature are very similar. Natural gas food products are... Natural gas. Yeah. What about propane? Is it similar? Um, I don't know the exact number for propane, but we, we for boiler side, we use the same number. It's the same number. Yeah. yeah. So as you see here, as we lower water temperature, look how our efficiency goes up. It's huge. The lower the water temperature, the more efficient AFUEF boiler is. Steady state boiler is. So like you. So our cast iron boilers live in this area, okay? You can't bring lower than, I use 140. Because if I say 135, you're gonna say 130, okay? But if I say 140 and you get 135, okay, we'll be okay. But, and, and let's face it, in, in shoulder weather, boiler, cast iron boilers condense a little bit because they're not always hot and the cycles are lower, so they've gotta build up temperature. Yeah, you're designed for Some 10 times. degrees and a little bit and then you go away running at 35 degrees. Right, exactly. So but this is this is a neat thing to know. And this is why this is how we work with the condensing product and we get the efficiencies that we're talking about. So one question. I think yeah. I started to say it before. So we've got a lot of old cast iron. Yes. We've got, we've got a lot more replacement boilers going in than we have new construction boilers. All right, so most of these old ones are the cast iron, non-condensing type that live on the right. right side. What was your typical design delta T across pretty much all your heat exchangers and your whole loops from 20. the outlet of the boiler to the back? 20. 20 max? No. 10 to 20? From a boiler's perspective, 40 degrees is usually their max. 40, 40 degrees max? Yeah. They don't want to see any more than a 45 degree. 80. No, that's bad. So when you get into the 40 range, though, and you're going out of 160, you're going to be condensing in a return. That's correct. So that's correct. That, that's so, that. But, 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 so look at that 10 degree or 20 degree delta then. But remember, <clears throat> we're primary secondary, okay? So I can take a 20 degree delta T in my system side and take a 40 degree delta T in my boiler loop because I have independent systems. I'm getting ahead of myself. But there's a lot of things we can do with primary secondary to the point where I would even tell you guys cast iron boilers to do primary secondary, quite honestly, because there's a lot of things you could do. You could take different delta T's through. But, but let's get back to the chart. So you guys understand this is where condensing boilers operate. If we're operating a condensing boiler up here, we may not, we may be a little higher, but we're we're not getting we're not getting that 90% efficiency even out of that boiler if we're operating in that higher water temperature all the time. Okay. So doing a heat loss, counting radiation, now do you start to see where that all comes together? If we're over radiated, we can lower water temperatures, we can justify condensing boilers. Versus under radiated, where we need a higher water temperature to satisfy the heat loss. Outdoor reset is what we use for condensing boilers. Outdoor reset says, just like I had mentioned that when I do a heat loss, I like to do a heat loss at design temperature, whatever you use, zero, 20, whatever six, as Asher says, or eight, and then 60. Now I've got my range of BTUs that I need between that heating period, okay? And that also helps me when I try to set my outdoor reset or my uh, control functions in my side of my border. What water temperatures do I really need? You have a lot bigger range you're allowed to use because you can't go too cold with the Yeah. Condenser. Although some of the condensing do, I mean, we use them for snow melt, you know, so you got, you got, you know. Well, they use them in domestic hot water, which is 55 
five in, which is your yeah, snow melt's coming back a lot colder than that. Yeah, yeah. But that's why your pipe primary secondary too. So you're making sure you're circulating that water in the boiler all the time anyway. So yeah, there there's still temperature limits with it that you gotta be aware of. The manufacturer does say it. So you still need to you need to thermal do it. shock. Yeah. You too low. Well you're gonna thermal shock a cast iron boiler a lot quicker than you're gonna thermal shock a right. condensing product. But what we're trying to do without the reset is match the water temperature for the heat loss. I need a lower water temperature to satisfy my heat demand when it's 70 in and 60 out. I don't need 180. I might be able to satisfy the heat load at 100, 120. If I leave the boiler at 120, am I condensing? Absolutely. My water is coming back a lot lower than that. If you can put it at 100, so condensing even more. So radiant jobs, radiant jobs are great for condensing boilers because you're you're always operating down there. Even a snow melt, maximum snow melt temperature I ever use is 130 degrees. That's max, absolute max. So that's great for condensing boilers because we're always in that high efficiency range. Oh, did I go the wrong way? So high pressure drop. So here's the way we pipe them. A little bit different than we did with a standard cast iron 80% boiler. We have what we call primary secondary. And the primary secondary right here is these closely spaced T's. I want to create as little a pressure drop between this loop and this loop. How far should these T's be apart? As close together as you can put them. But no four, more typically 12 inches. Four inches. Well, well, that's the answer I was looking for. 12. See, now he's 12 inches. No, it's not. It's That's the answer I wanted. But the manufacturer is showing 12 inches. They say max. Actually, what it is is four, four pipe, pipe diameters apart. So if I have one inch pipe, the furthest my outlet for that T should be is what? Four. One times four is four inches. That's the maximum. You know where the 12 inch comes in? Three times four is what? 12. Four times four is what? 16. No, in our case, it's 12. Okay? So that's where the 12 inch comes in. <laughs> do math. See? Do math. Yeah. This is common core math right now. I'm going into. <laughs> Can we use the same numbers when you price me a boiler? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 See, four man? times bigger boiler? 16? No, it's the same number. But that's where the 12 inch comes into. It's 12 inch max no matter what pipe size you have. But the maximum is really four pipe diameters. So one inch pipe in the main, four times one, four inches is the maximum. If you can get them closer, get them closer. The answer you said, the closer the better is absolutely it. I don't like to use numbers, you don't like math. To me, as close as you can get them. And if you're even you close. a pump and a valve, you don't have to worry about the heat migration anyway. Uh, now I'll get funny. Okay, okay. but. That's, seriously, primary second, and you're going to see more and more primary secondary piping because condensing boilers aren't going away, whether it's commercial or residential or anything. They're not going away. Am I saying that we're going to be like Europe and there's going to be only condensing boilers and you can't produce more than 140 degrees out of a boiler? No, not yet, but maybe someday we will. Be. So I just recently had an experienced technician tell me that on a Primary, secondary, the secondary return should be turned back in upstream of the pullback. Okay, uh, you, you're confusing me because what does primary, secondary really mean? Because I don't like to turn primary, secondary, I lose it, but I'd rather call it boiler loop, system okay, loop. Boiler loop. So you've okay. got a boiler loop with a branch off to one part of the system. Okay. And you've got your two takeoff T, your takeoff and return T, closely spaced close as possible, mm -hmm. right? And what he was trying to tell me was the water that's coming back into the boiler loop should come in upstream of where it takes off. That so does it make sense? So, so this is my return, okay? This, and, and I did this on purpose, and this question kind of leads me to it. Because this is my return, I want my coldest water going back into my boiler, right. and I want to come out of my boiler and go this way. I want the pump actually, on the, my system pump, on the outlet side of my closely spaced T's. I want it over here. 
This pump, I usually want to pump into the heat exchanger. That's very important because they have a high pressure drop. And remember, a pump has a differential. If I try to pump out of the boiler, what am I creating inside the boiler? Yeah. A lower pressure. What does water do at lower temperature? Boil, lower pressure. Boil, it can boil easy. off. Okay, so we don't want to do that. So on this side, we want to pump into the boiler. But on this side, we want to pump away from the point of no pressure change and out to the system. So this drawing, as I show with these cool arrows, I did figure out how to do this, is is actually wrong, okay? Does I would rather... needs to move over to the A position? It needs to be over there, yes. Okay, that's a better system. The next slide actually has zone pumps and they're in the right position. They're on the outlet side of my supply coming from my boiler to my system. This is what I'd rather see, okay? Still pumping away from my point of no pressure change going out to the system. Does that make sense, guys? It sounds like what they told this guy was to try to do some kind of pre-mixing before it comes back. So pre-mixing is not necessarily primary secondary. Pre-mixing is boiler or system bypass. And I'm wondering if that was some confusion. And there's a lot of confusion. Well, I, I've seen it. If you go back to your other drawing, it shows the, the way instead of doing your... Um, oh, 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 hold on. Back about three or four. That other system where you said by the time you got down to the last one, it was too cold. Oh, the series loop. Yeah. The oh, the yeah, the, the primary, system, secondary, primary and secondary. Those. those were the ones that that uh, we were talking about. This one. No. 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 One more. This one. That one. Right. 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 There's no, there's no arrow showing which way. Okay, so he said that the take off right. should come back. So here's should our be downstream of what's here, coming back. Here's our supply. Remember, we always want to pump away from the point of no pressure okay. change. Right. So in a pump sim symbol, I don't know if you can see that, but the pointy part of this drawing, in a pump, that's the direction of flow. That's our symbol for pumps. That's a pump guy symbol. I draw that symbol a lot. I, I think I. It's a diode. Well, that's what an electrician told me. He said, why would you draw a diode in here? I was like, well, it's directional. Hey, didn't know I did a diode. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, see, these pumps are doing the same thing. This is the direction of flow. Right. So, so my direction of flow is going this way. I want this secondary loop. So the true meaning of primary secondary is this. The larger pipe is the primary. The smaller pipe is the secondary. Primary okay. is the heat source, secondary is where the no, heat goes. No, 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 no. That's boiler loop, system loop. Primary and secondary. So right now, this is primary, that's secondary, right? How about our next slide? We still didn't answer the question. Well, I, I know, but I want, I, I gotta make a point. How about the next slide? Which is primary, which is secondary? Well, the primary is that loop by the boiler right there. The no, no, this is secondary, it's smaller than this. It changes. That's why I don't like to use the term primary secondary. It's just based on which are the bigger part? The bigger loop. Yeah, that's the primary loop. It has nothing to do with the heat source. Oh. Huh. That's what I didn't know. That's why when you call me, I say my primary loop or my secondary loop, I say, I hang up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I can't help you. Inches. I can't help you. <laughs> Four times pipe diameter. No, I, I, I have to know. So I, I ask the question, is that boiler loop or is that system loop? What's the primary loop? Because everybody wants to believe the primary loop is the boiler loop. It's not. I, I think everybody knows the, boiler, the primary loop is the reactor water. <laughs> <laughs> Do we get credits for this class? Because he's not getting it. <laughs> no, seriously, but that's true primary secondary when they describe it, it's the larger loop. This, so in this case, this is our primary, that's our secondary, but in that other example, um, that changed. This is our primary loop here, and this is our secondary. On a system design like that, mm -hmm. you showed the flow going down the big pipe. Show me where the flow should go on the little on the secondary. So, so that arrow, you can't see it probably, but that arrow's pointing up. So I want to pump into my zone, through my zone, and then it returns here. Just downstream of where it took off. Yes. On the primary. Four pipe diameters. Right. Same principle. Okay. Four pipe yeah. diameter max. 
kind of decouple. When you do it this way. So like you mentioned earlier, we're going to see more and more of these. Yes. Which means we're going to see more and more of them down the line. Yes. I love it. Because I go out all the time. You know what? I hate them. I hate, I hate when I tell somebody to pipe it closely spaced tees and I go out and it's 12 inches. Because that's what the book said. And that, that's, I hear that a lot. Well, that's easy to tell the helper. But that's awfully nice that's to know his that foot on the pipe. That's awfully, it's, it's, <laughs> it's awfully nice to know that somebody <laughs> actually opened the book, right, right. which is good. So they saw something, but they saw the wrong thing. But it's four pipe diameters, and I don't care if it's primary or secondary, closely spaced T's. If you're using primary, secondary, they have to be four pipe diameters max. Okay. But if you're crimping your copper. You can put it right to leave to the enough there so that if you have a leak, you can replace yes, yeah. one fitting and not two. And guess what? Don't do this and put a valve in the middle. Oh. It defeats the purpose. <laughs> we want no pressure drop through there. I don't care if it's a full port valve or whatever. Don't do it. That's at the end of the loop for the chill water system. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But what if it's hot water, chill water on the same loop? Yeah, you can do that. I'll be, out, I'll be out on the job. Somebody's got to open the gap out on the spring, too. So, we're going to catch back up. Uh, we're probably already over time, but I want to I wanna go through a couple oh, quick people. things on primary, secondary piping, guys, because to understand this, and again, the reason why I use all these red arrows, because I sell red pumps. Ah, and that's just highlighting that. pumps. That's all. I'm sorry. But this Wait, is primary, you... secondary, okay? This is our, our pipes. This is our four pipe diameters, not to exceed 12, but it depends on the pipe size, okay? Depends on the pipe size. So get them as close as you can. So here's what happens. There's another way to do this. You don't have to worry about that spacing. You can use what they call a hydro separator. This happens to be a spire vent quad, Wow. okay? You pipe your boiler into one side, supply and return, system into the other side, supply and return. Simple. Huh. You're gonna need an air separator anyway. If you're tying into an old system, you probably want a dirt separator. The, high, the quad does all of it. It does air, it does dirt, and it does your primary secondary connection. Simple. And if you buy its competition, it comes with a magnet too. Yeah. So don't do that. <laughs> oh, Lord. He's not saying why. I'm just saying don't do that. Everybody's losing <laughs> points from, tonight. Yeah. Going back to red. What's that? Was there a separate patent on a red pen too? Or? I thought they were gold. Well, gold is for oh, what? These? Or the pumps? So gold is for domestic water. Oh, brass. Brass. Yeah. Brass or, or stainless steel now is more, more prevalent. So, so yeah, we, we didn't even get into the pump side of it, but quads can, can certainly save you time on a job and all the guesswork's gone. Right. Again, plus you gotta add all that. And we do make a magnetic air dirt separator, but our quad does not come with a magnet. Our air dirt separator does, so okay. there. What else does that do? So there, Kevin. <laughs> so there, Kevin. <laughs> He's got okay, so here's what happens inside of a primary secondary loop. Real quick, I want to go over a couple slides. So I've got 10 gallons a minute going through the system. Okay, so this is my boiler loop. This is smaller piping than that. What is this loop? Secondary. secondary. Nice. What is this loop? Primary. All right. What am I going to ask you? Boiler loop, system loop. Okay, I really don't care you. at that point, but... But you get my point. It, it, is, it is different and it can change. That's why I don't like using the term primary, secondary. So we got five gallons a minute coming back from our... Okay, so let's, let's start right from here. I don't have a boiler pump on right now, but I do have a system pump on. What's going through the system loop? I got 10 gallons a minute going through the system, 10 gallons a minute. I actually have 10 gallons a minute going through the whole pipe. Okay? Because this pump's not on, there's no pressure drop here, there's no reason for flow to go here, right? Remember, people like to take the path of this resistance, and so does water. They usually say water and then people, but whatever, okay? So, so there's 10 gallons a minute. As soon as I turn that boiler pump on, the secondary boiler pump, it needs five gallons a minute, so it takes five gallons a minute, pumps it through the boiler, puts five gallons a minute back, 
And let me tell you, one of the principles of primary and secondary teeth is that what goes into a teeth must come out of the teeth. Very simple process. So if I take 10 here, I take five out, I put five in, I got 10 coming out. What's between the T's? Five gallon a minute, like it says, okay? This site's easy because I put the number there. So it's easy. <laughs> but 10 gallon a minute, five's going through the, the teeth. That, that's, temper, that's tempered water, basically, because this is hot, this is cold, so this isn't quite as hot as this. Wait, which way is our flow going? Our flow's going this way. Right remember, I, remember I want to take the cold water into the boiler, take the hot red and, oh. red and blue is blue. color. Color for hot. Our primary loops, not the boiler loop, because it's phase. So we didn't cover that. That is right. No, we did. I said, what is this loop? It's the secondary loop. It's the smaller loop. The boiler's down here. You said primary loop and secondary loop, but we didn't know the boiler's down there. That could have that could have been a branch line going to a... Uh, it could have been. Uh, Does it ma doesn't matter. Well, yeah, because it was going to a load. We are going to fight. I, I, I heard you say no, We are going to fight. I said, no, 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 no. I said, no, no, no. I, I, I say, boiler. Let me raise your hand. I said, boiler. Okay. It, so, it matters so, because it goes back to that no, question that I asked you earlier. It does. But but I th on this one, I said, boiler. The boiler. Yeah. So okay. so we're going to take our return from the system, our primary loop, and go to our secondary loop boiler. And we're going to go, this is the colder water coming right. in. We're going to heat the water, and it's going to go back here. And if I take five out, what goes into a T must come out of a T. So i got five in between those T's. So you're tempering at 50-50 with your water. Yeah, and it's fire. exactly. And I'm injecting heat, so to speak. By getting a colder it. supply temp, you get a colder return temp. You get more efficiency out of your... You can play around with them because with primary and secondary, you got that, you got that flexibility. And what determines the flow through those loops? These guys. The pump and pump, pump speeds. Pump and balance. Yeah. Pump balance, either a speed or a balance. Those balance. pumps aren't all different sizes, are they? If yes. It, if it fits, it's the same flow, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. Can I take you to all my meetings? <laughs> No, because he's, it's exactly right. Just because that pump has the same face-to-face -face dimension of this pump, is it the same pump? Absolutely not, and I have this argument all the time. Give me a pump that fits. Well, that doesn't mean you're getting the right pump, just because it fits the same face-to-face -face dimension. I don't even ask the salespeople. I, I want to see the pump curves. Curve. Like, give them to exactly. me and look up all the pumps on... Yep. So this is kind of what we just talked about, except which is my primary loop in this case? You can't tell the pipe size. You can't tell the pipe size. I knew you were going to say that. Actually, I think that's pretty close. Cool. <laughs> no. But in this particular case, I'm calling this as my boiler loop, but I'm calling it my primary loop because I'm saying this pipe is bigger. Okay. It's called the Trust me. Me. Okay. So we call you, we should down. tell you, boiler yeah. loop is the primary loop. Or the boiler loop. Well, right. right. If you tell then me we would that, all be on the same page. Exactly. Exactly. It's but you got to know the difference. That's why I got to. That one has to be bigger. It's moving 10 gallons per minute. That's right. So, based on correct pipe sizing, you're going to have a bigger pipe in the it's boiler the loop. What size pipe primary. we had in the shop? <laughs> Shut up. Hey, yeah, I know that happens. Trust me. So, that's, our, that's our example. Okay. okay. And this, this mixes you all up, too, because now we're flowing this way instead of the other way. But anyway, this pump's pumping out. This pump's pulling that out, going through the system, and injecting back in, okay? How about if I have a pump on this secondary loop that wants 10 gallons a minute? So now I've got 10 oh, going through the oh, primary. Oh, boy. I take 10 gallons out. What's going between the T's? You can do this. Zero. Absolutely. Unless you've got other loops, and then they're going to be getting... Well, I'm still putting water back in if they're downstream of here. I'm it just turns it into in. the same as a series type <laughs> system. But only when both of them are trying to run the same. Well, now let's, I'm really going to blow your mind now. Uh -oh. So now down. if I got 10 gallons a minute here, and I pulled 12 gallons a minute out here, uh -oh. what, what do I got doing? going through those T's? Backflow. Not negative flow, but backflow. I'm, I'm actually tempering this loop. So I can design oh. my primary and secondary system at different delta T's and different water temperatures because of just the speed of this pump. 
Again, what goes into a T must come out of the T. If I have 10 going here, this wants 12. It's got to come from somewhere. So it pulls it back in and circulates it. That happens in my checking accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your number? <laughs> yeah. So the quad, again, eliminate the guesswork of primary, secondary. You need good quality air separation and everything else. Is there any sizing involved with the yes separators? Yes. So, so the the vessel is larger than the pipe size coming in. You never want to decrease pipe size going into an air separator, any kind of air separator, ever. But a quad, same thing. Your okay. system design dictates the pipe size, and then you pick the device based on that. Pipe. Yes, but quads and air separators are you good? Are, oversizing them doesn't hurt doesn't you. Hurt. It costs you more money, but it doesn't hurt you. But they will size this pipe for the correct flow at four feet of loss per second. But this canister is bigger. This is where we get our. What was that pipe size again? The rule that you just I'm gonna to get to it. Okay. Do, do we really stay till 10? Okay, <laughs> so there's a lot of things here, guys. So again, back to our fundamentals. We talked about temperature differential. Now we're gonna talk about flow differential, and we did, we sprinkled some pump information in there. Do I need a pump to circulate water through a system? No. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Natural <laughs> circulation. You don't. Right. As we heat water, it becomes less dense. Oh, well, yeah. And as the heavier, dense, colder water starts to circulate, there are a lot of gravity hot water systems yes, in this there area. Are. There are. And it's because they oversized the piping. And actually, most of them were steam jobs converted to hot water because the piping was so large. They replaced some returns, made the piping large, no resistance to overcome. Once I heat the water, it becomes it's driving air out, right? We're getting those little bubbles in. It starts to circulate. And again, when water moves, it all has to move. So we have gravity circulations. And you talk to people up in the Cleveland Heights, University Heights area, it's a place like that, that have a cold, hot water gravity system. They love it. It's quiet. It takes a little bit longer to heat up, but it's just nice, quiet, comfortable heat. Very nice. But all the heat doesn't go to the coldest room anymore. What's that? Because all the heat. Yeah, I guess it would. It's just gonna, it's gonna make it more dense faster. Right. Right. So it's all about pipe size. So the reason why pipe pumps were invented basically is because we wanted to buy smaller pipes because they were cheaper to run our distribution lines. So we needed to overcome that resistance just by gravity. It didn't happen anymore. I say that kind of a chummy, by tongue in cheek, but. But as we create resistance, we need to overcome that resistance. And as we increase in flow, we increase the resistance. So a pump just works. A centrifugal pump works based on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I have technology. Okay, it works on the basis of this. This is the impeller. This is the suction eye of the impeller. Water comes into the suction eye of the impeller, and through centrifugal action, it flings the water out up against the housing of the pump, and the housing is what directs the flow. So I'm going to send this around, but before we do that, you see these veins? Okay, you see the veins inside the impeller? Does this impeller go this way? This is the suction. Does it go this way? So that's left. Or does it go right? That way. It goes right? Does everybody agree with that? It would work no. if the veins are straight and they're swept left. back for efficiency. It goes left? It left it's no. It actually goes right. It's opposite. It flinging water. So the water is coming in the middle. Centrifugal action is pushing it out to the edge of the vein. And then the vein is actually directing it up and through the pump. So the pump actually goes this way. So when you're checking direction or rotation, especially commercially, you pass that around. Remember, you can change any two leads and change the direction of rotation of a pump. It's not a three phase. If it's pump. three phase. If it's three phase, right, three phase. What did I say? Did I say single phase? You didn't so mention that. Single phase, you, you just switched the start. Well, I said commercially, so to me, commercially is always three phase, but you're right. 
So three phase, if you switch it into region and change the direction, we have it all the time. Going in the wrong direction does not change the direction of flow. It's the volute or the body that determines the direction of flow. It will reduce your capacity. And again, there are pumps out there that we've designed or said they're grossly oversized. You either cut the impeller or you run it in reverse. Because they were throttling that pump down. It was three quarters of the way throttle. So if you're doing to unload the amps of that pump, Resistance on that pump means less flow, and that means less amps. Do you have a picture of a discharge uh, control valve? Are you talking just like an isolation valve? No. Yes. Well, a balance valve is better. If you just use a gate valve, over time, it's going to wire draw, and you're not going to be able to no. shut it off. So a globe-style valve is good, or they make balance valves. Or in commercial jobs, we use what we call a Flotrex valve. It's a triple-duty valve. It's got a check valve, a balancing valve, and it's got meter ports on it. So there are valves that you use. And if you ever have to balance a pump, never do it on the suction side. Always on the discharge side of a pump. If you look at these little inlines, this is what we call the volute in the pump world. It's kind of weird, but... And if you look at this pump, and remember, all the flow has to go into the center of the impeller. Which is the suction side? The bottom. This one, right? Because it's got to go up and into the center of the impeller. And this is my discharge. So if you look at any one of these inline pumps, they're all going to be the same. So if you need to know what's your suction and what, which way your flow's going, your flow when this one's coming up and then discharging out. It's right off the top of the pump. You can tell that on all inline pumps. I don't care if it's the other red pump company or a green company or whatever it is. They're all the same. Okay, on the inlines. With end suction pumps, you have a flange right here, and then this is the body of the pump, and then this is the discharge of the pump. That's called a top center line end suction pump. Okay, the color's in there doing the same thing. What year did they standardize the, from the tangential to the center line? Um, so, so Armstrong did that about close to 20 years ago now. Uh, the other red pump company still is tangential. They're off the side. So they can do their replacements? Or the, no? the, the taco, the taco, <laughs> didn't scratch that. Um, they, they go off the top center line too. That's an ANSI dimension. And what they believed is that it was better for venting and getting all the air out of the pump. I thought it was just easier for them to use the CAD probe. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's easier to pipe. I, can, I think, because you're right, lining right. it up right with right, the suction pipe. Right, up. Yeah, and it is, it is. So you it, go to the place one, and all you can find is a Well, if you're an ANSI dimensional, now all the pumps are interchangeable, because that's a specific dimension, yes. Right. Okay, inline circulators, again, are through some of these things. Um, pumps are circulators, we talked about it. That's a pump curve. We have foot of head which is what we're doing is, is, is overcoming resistance, and we have gallons per minute. And a commercial pump curve looks something like that. That's a 16-inch uh, diameter impeller, okay, going up to 500 horsepower. And that's what it looks like. And with a commercial pump, they trim the impeller to match the capacity, and then that relates to horsepower. And when I talked about <coughs> throttling back a pump, what you're doing is if a pump's running out on the curve, and these are the horsepower lines, and you're run, if it was designed here, but there's less resistance in the system, and it's running out here, you're overloading the horsepower. Your amps are going way up. What you have to do is throttle it back, and that's where the discharge valve and a lot of pumps are throttled. Oh, you mean it's like over FLA or something? Yeah, like yeah. Or, or just knocking out the breakers completely. I mean, seen it. Wow. So, so they, they, they balance it, they bring that pump back on the sweet spot of the curve, which is in the middle of the curve. Can you go back and tell the engineer you made a mistake? What effect does a VFT have? How, how would you so our, our, pick your minimum and your maximum on that? Yeah. So in a variable <clears throat> speed, we're actually shifting impeller curves is what we're doing by changing the speed. So we're putting in a big impeller, but we're modulating the speed, and we're running up and down the system curve. 
This system curve is very important. These are some equations real quick that are very important. Remember 8.3, where did that come from? Weight of water. Weight of one gallon of water, right? 60, we're converting yeah, from seconds. gallons per minute and BTUs. Hours to TD is our temperature differential. We can size pumps and make our GPM based on BTUs divided by this equation. If you round it out, it's 10,000. So if I have 200,000 BTU butter and I want to distribute 200,000 BTUs, what do I need? I need a pump to do 20 gallons a minute. That's how simple it is to figure out what pump you need. This equation, GPM is equal to BTUs divided by 10,000 at a 20 degree delta T. But if we're gonna change the delta T, then we have to change this bottom, this number down. There's like a standard chart somewhere too I saw for like your pipes, that, like in your copper size. Yeah. Like half, a quarter. Yeah, water. I have it in here too. Uh, here's some other ones for chilled water. This is my 2.31 feet equals one PSI. Remember, water column. And this is whether it's a one inch pipe or a 10 inch pipe. I don't care how much water column it is or how wide it is, the height of the water determines that pressure at the bottom, okay? So 4.3 PSI is 10 feet. 43 pounds, 100 foot. Okay? It doesn't matter what size the pipe is. And specific gravity has something to do with it, but we're getting deep in there. This is the chart you were talking about. Yeah. This is our pipe sizing chart. Again, I don't care what the connection size of the equipment is. These are the rules you want to follow. And if you want this, send me an email. It's on the product. They're, on the, they're all over the internet. You can find them. You start going over it's that. It's actually in that heating helper as well. You start going over that, you start getting flow noise and other issues. Too. What is this called again? This is called the proper close of hydronic piping chart. So if you have if you have 200,000 BTUs that you want to deliver, okay, and you have inch and a quarter pipe, are you going to be able to get 200,000 BTUs out of it? No. Page 36. No. Page 36. Thank you. Okay. So it's very important if you do service. You need to almost understand these numbers that if I'm trying to deliver a zone and I've got a two inch a pipe going to that zone and I've got 600,000 BTUs connected to it, I'm not going to get it. I can get it. I can sell you a big, big, big pump, but it's too big. It's not right. And you're going to have noise problems. Pipe sizing is important. So this is good heat transfer and it's good velocity through the system. For heat transfer and for quietness. Okay, I can pump through any pipe, but you just don't want the pump. When somebody says they want to double the flow, and we talked about this before we started, somebody wants to double the flow in an existing system, it's not the next size pump up. You you have if you want to double the flow, you have four times the horsepower, or four times the. And now I'm, I'm losing track of right. Four times the horsepower, no, eight times the horsepower. You have um, double the flow, four times the head, eight times the horsepower. Excuse me. I had a glimpse there. You can just go two pumps in parallel. You can go two pumps in parallel, but you're still restricted by that chart. On, so, on the yeah, the pipe size still is, is pipe size. Now, I, I, have, I have done series piping if the pump, if the pipe was too small. Series pumping means I pump out of one into another, and I double the head. Yeah. Parallel yeah, pumping, pump. parallel pumping is doubling the flow, but I gotta have the right pipe size for that flow to double. Okay, so pipe resistance is what we're talking about here. I'll be glad to send you that chart. But as we flow through a pipe, water's moving through the pipe. It creates resistance. It tries to slow the water down. The more water we try to put through a pipe the more pressure drop we have going through that pipe. Every fitting, every elbow, every valve, everything has a pressure drop. And they usually relate it to feet of equivalent length of piping. Okay, so a 90 degree elbow might have three equivalent length of piping. 
Look at our model flow T, 25 feet of pipe, pressure drop, but we want pressure drop there, right? Because we want to slow that flow down and divert it. Is that, that was too like, what was that globe valve? Why was that so high? Is that not a full flow globe valve? Look at a flow check. Talk about high. Oh ball, ball valve seven. Is that a, do you have a full flow? Valve? It's full, full bore. So in, in heating, well, it's, still a, it's still got a seven? Yeah. That's seven, a of, seven feet of piping worth of pressure drop. That's what that means. In a full so flow that you can see right through right. with the pipe. Still has a pressure drop. Wow. It's so not. That's what's that, huh? Well, it's not fully full flow. Yeah. Right. There's a pressure drop. They have. They have one. Some they have they have forty percent, sixty percent. You know they have different valves. Plumbing, we don't use full port ball valves in plumbing most of the time. Okay, but in heating systems, we want you to use full port ball valves because again, we, the more resistance you have, the more pump power I need to overcome it. So what the point is is everything has a pressure drop that we have to overcome. So if I need twenty gallons a minute through that system. I have to be able to overcome all that resistance to get 20 gallons a minute. If I have more resistance, I'm not going to get 20 gallons a minute. A pump is a dumb animal. All it knows is it has to work on the pump curve. It doesn't care if it's down here or down here. The system is what determines where the pump runs. That's why you're balancing that discharge to bring that pump back on the curve. You're creating resistance. So as a rule of thumb, very simple. If you measure the longest loop in run, if I have three zones, one's 50 feet, one's 75 feet, and one's 100 feet, and if I have to have a pump to overcome resistance, do I add all those resistances? The answer is no. I have to just overcome the most resistant loop in the system. If I have enough pump head to do that, then I can get the resistance I need. So I size it for that 100 foot loop. So I measure the longest run in feet, guesstimate, because pipes in the ceilings, we don't know. But if the boiler's here and the last piece of radiation is down there, you can kind of guess. It's 50 feet away. So I got 50 feet there, I got 50 feet back. I had 50% for fittings and valves and everything else. So I have what? 150 feet of pipe. If I take that times 0.04, that's my pump head. Okay? Again, if you guys want this, I can send it to you. But this is a quick and simple and easy way to find out if you have enough pump in your system. Because I took this pump out, doesn't mean this pump is going to give me the same flow through there. They have different characteristics, pump characteristics. And the system curve is this. Again, as I increase in flow, I increase in resistance. And it's where the system curve and the pump curve meet, that's where I'm going to get the flow. So if my system resistance curve has less resistance <clears throat> and it's down here, then that's when I start to overload my horsepower. That's why we got to create that resistance to bring it back. But it's high the flow. The higher the flow, the lower your return. The higher the flow, the more resistance in the system. But the higher the flow, the more heat you're moving. So you, you, you well wanted to reason. talk about delta T it's, through the out. Remember we talked about right radiation? Down. So everybody says, if I'm not getting the heat out of my radiator, slow it down. I'm going to get more heat. I say you're not. It just okay. goes like TN. It changes your delta T. But if I have a piece of baseboard that's 10 <laughs> foot long, and I'm designing it around a 20 degree delta T, so I got 180 in and 160 out. Low work. And I want to so get your average is 170. 170. And your room temp 70, so your delta T between your radiator and your room's on. Right. But if I want to get more heat out of that baseboard, I say speed it up. So now I go from 180 to 170. What's my average water temperature? 175. Five degrees warmer. Now you got 105 between your radiator and your room. So you're going to get more heat out of it. Don't slow it down. Speed it up if you're going to do anything. But it's coming out colder. It must be taking out more heat. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, to show you this. Pumps have different curves. That little wet rotor runs at a higher RPM than that three-piece circulator, even though it fits the same face-to-face -face dimension. What if I have a 120,000 BTU boiler, and remember our equation was divided by 10,000? I need 12 gallons a minute for that system. 
The old pump did 12 gallons a minute. I put the new pump in because it's cheaper, it's smaller, it's quieter, and it fits the fa same face-to-face -face dimension. Are you getting the same amount of heat out of it? No, because it only goes to 10. It only goes to 100,000 BTU. So you're picking up the motor. I'm going to change the delta T through the system now. So instead of a 20 degree, I might be getting a 30. And it, and maybe that's not, remember what I said in the shoulder weather, we don't see the mistakes, but when it really gets cold, we see them. That pump that you put in in the spring, work through the spring, no, fall. Work through the fall and into the early winter, but then when it got cold, they didn't get enough heat out of there. And you say, why, it worked fine for all this time. So you go check, see if it plugged up the impeller or whatever, you know, it wasn't that. It was that we changed the characteristic of that system. We're no longer delivering 120 BTUs. We're only delivering 100. Does that make sense? So if you're going to change the pump and go to a wet rotor, call and let's let's make sure you're putting the right pump in. So if it's a bigger three piece and you want to go to a wet rotor, and it's the same face to face dimension. There are other wet rotors. It's a whole family of them. So you can you match one. You can and walk that on the. Yeah, well, again, it's just like condensing boilers. You can change it. Um, flow goes in the path of least resistance. Balancing, nine times out of ten. I love selling bigger pumps, guys, commercially, but there's so many times we go out there and say, well, you know, this is the third pump I've been to, and I still can't get heat at the end. Okay? Nine times out of ten, it's a balancing issue because I'm telling you the original pump is kind of like boilers. A lot of them are 50 to 100% oversized. Okay, that's why your discharge valve is throttled. Can't oh. tell me that it's been running fine for 40 years. Yeah, sure. But he never. But he calls me every year and says I don't have heat at the end. And I say, well, let's balance. No, we need a bigger pump. Okay, I'll sell you a bigger pump. But let's balance also. Um, but if we create resistance, water wants to flow to the path of least resistance. So so do humans. If I'm a human. I'm going to want to go here and get back home before I go all the way out here and all the way back. Same with water. But A is Vegas. Well, then you want to stop a couple places to eat before you get to Vegas. So, so you put balance valves in here. You throttle these things. You might throttle this one half, three quarter. This one maybe a smidge. And now you're going to get flow out there. The flow's there, it's just going in the wrong places. So these two people have their windows open, and they're getting all kinds of heat, they've got a delta T of two through their system, and they're getting no flow down here. It's normally not a bigger pump. Oh. Okay, another thing I wanna say, closed loop systems, okay? Closed loop, my pump only has to overcome resistance. Resistance. I was in a room with 62 engineers at ASHRAE, did a meeting about pumps, and I asked them, do I have to calculate the lift in this application in a closed loop system? And I got about 50% of the mechanical engineers that said yes, and 50 did it. Okay? They knew that all I had to do was overcome resistance because of that. Ferris wheel effect, right? Once I start moving water, so all I have to do is overcome resistance that I'm going through this loop. That's all I have to do. I don't care if this building is 200 feet tall or 200 feet wide. It's the same feet ahead. What's the pump casing rated for though? You do have to, there is a consideration at a certain height. Working pressure of 175 PSI. You're good there. Yeah. That's our standard pump. You're getting about three, four hundred feet. Yeah, it's 175 psi times 2.31. Because that's what you're going to see on the gauge when it's just sitting there on. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the static, yeah, that column of water. But again, I don't care from a pump perspective whether that building's 200 feet tall or 200 feet long. It's the same pump pad. Nobody puts gauges in anymore. Well, so I so I tell people not to put gauges in across a commercial pump. I say put pet cocks in, yeah, okay? Something. Something in, so I can use one gauge and what go from suction and discharge and get a reading, a differential. From that differential, I can go to that pump curve and tell you what flow rate's going through that pump. 
So there's our Ferris wheel effect. Once we start moving the water, it all has to move. And that's why we don't have to add head. Or add... Um, Did half your engineers change their answer when they saw the tower water one? Yeah, except for one. He just oh, shook yeah. his head. This guy's nuts. I said, I picked, <laughs> him, I picked him out. I happened to know him. And I says, yes, you're right. I am nuts. <laughs> but pumps, um, I'm going to probably stop there because I got a whole bunch more. But um, expansion tanks, you know, we, these are the old conventional tanks where we separated the air and it went back up through a tank fitting. Any more guys, go with a, a diaphragm type expansion tank. If you got an old expansion tank and you're doing some work, try to replace it. Cut the pipe, put a bladder tank in, leave the thing up in the ceiling. Who cares if it's up there or not? They're not calling them expansion tanks anymore. Trying to change it. I call them expansion tanks. I know. So do I. They're the old school. But if you really want to size an expansion tank, you know what I need? I need all this to really size an expansion tank. Total system volume, minimum system temperature, maximum system temperature, minimum operating pressure, maximum operating pressure. I need all that information to size a tank. If you're just going to say I got, you know, 200 suites of an apartment building or something, that doesn't help. Me. Or you're going to tell me I got 2 million BTUs, what expansion tank do I need? The biggest one I got. In the I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make some good money. Oversizing an expansion tank isn't going to hurt me, but undersizing will kill me. Because if I don't have enough expansion, pressure increases and we start popping relief valves, we start having all kinds of problems. That's what the expansion tank does because as we heat water, it expands. And again, it's a non compressible. Something has to give. That's why we put air in the tank to make air is compressible. So we compress that air and we get rid of that expansion. Okay, so if you, you you need to size something, we got a lot. Hey, my watch went up. I got all my steps in. It's fun time. Nice. Uh -huh. um, but good air separators to me are an insurance policy, guys. Get rid of the air. Air is what's causing this ferrous oxide to grow, and it's basically the deterioration of your system. Air is an insulator, so it's it's not helping our heat transfer. Air and water running through a pipe. You can hear. If the air's out of water, you can't hear water running through a pipe. Unless it's totally undersized. Yes, that's what I'm saying. If you have normal and you hear water running through radiators, they got air in it. Get rid of the air. It's bad. It doesn't do us any good. We might have black pipe, cast iron boilers. Air's going to be destructive to that. And again, it's an insulator. You want an efficient system? Get the air out. I prefer mine, but uh, you know there's other good ones out there. So, so that's a tangential. You can probably see a lot of these tangential air separators. That's a high capacity air eliminator. And there's our quads again. Guys, I like these. When I do a design for somebody, I design, especially condensing boilers, I put quads in. Okay, air's bad, blah, 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 blah. Um, some, something else we got to be worried about nowadays is combustion air for boilers. At least with condensing boilers, you're bringing in outside air and then venting. But standard conventional boilers, uh, buildings are becoming tighter and tighter, so combustion air becomes critical. We got to make sure we have enough. Residentially, people are finishing off basements that were never finished before and they're walling in the mechanical room. Now you got a water heater and you got a cast iron boiler in there and, and they closet. start to have problems. In yeah, in a closet. They don't have enough combustion in there. So we have to make sure we're aware of that. Yeah, this is just some basic hydronic tips. Um, again, if you want some of this information, that's something I'll include because it's got an equation to calculate your feet of cubic feet of air. This is a pump. What is that? That is a pump. Huh? It's the coolest pump I've ever seen. Where is it? At? That is up in Buffalo, New York. It's at their water plant. This is hey, a steam, steam-driven pump. What? The steam was up here, produced up here, came down and moved these arms. It's hard to see it. And moved those wheels, and they were the 
pumps for the water system uh, in Buffalo. Wow. There's three, there were three of them like this. Now they've all been replaced and there's a little pump set back there. Not little, I mean they're big horizontal split case pumps, but that's what the thing looks like. That's an eight foot ladder. Wow. Wasn't that, uh, that's huge. That was the coolest place I ever went. So we went just to sightsee and I'm just like fascinated with this and my kids and my wife are like, let's go to the, no, <laughs> leave me here. I'm, I'm talking to the guy that runs the place there. Yeah, it's great. So commercial pumps, I, I did a bunch of, same. like I said, I got way too many slides. Um, but that's what a commercial pump, base mounted and suction pump looks like. Um, again, suction goes into the middle. The impeller is rotating, it's slapping against the balloon, and then it directs the flow out through the discharge. Okay? Base mounted pump, these are a pain, although they're out there and they use them a lot, because you got a bearing assembly, you got a coupler, you got to grout the base, you got to align it. And everybody says, well, it's aligned from the factory. Yeah, but it gets on a truck in Buffalo, New York, and bounces down 990. Gets to our job site, the floor may or may not be level. We hang pipe off of it, we tighten it up. <laughs> Any alignment you thought you had is go way on. gone. I've got a good story about that. Way gone. So, so always do that. But the industry is kind of trending towards vertical uh, inlines where you you mount the, the mount the pump in the pipe, support the piping, and there's no pump support at all. This happens to be a twin which is kind of nice, but that's a vertical inline. Again, you're supporting the piping and let the pump move with the piping. As long as you support the piping properly, you're in good shape. That's that twin pump. Look at the space savings that that creates. That could be primary, secondary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we still use that term. I mean, one run, one standby, or we can run both of those pumps together and do parallel pumping Okay, in that design. And now, of course, VFDs are becoming more and more popular. So you're probably commercial, you're going to probably not see a standard motor without a VFD on it in the near future. It's already moving that way. It's the easiest way to get the efficiency up on the free pairs. Yeah, absolutely. They're quiet, and they do good. And, and this new technology, you get apps, you can see where the, where the pump's running. There's, I mean... You can control it. It's, it's crazy. Do you actually know what the GPM is when oh, yeah. you're looking at a boiler? You or can a tell what the bearing temperature is on these apps that they have with some of these uh, commercial pumps now. So suction guides. Remember, we want to keep the suction side as free and open as possible on a commercial pump. A suction guide gives you a couple of things. It gives you a strainer. And there's two strainers in there. One's a startup screen and one's a normal run screen. And nobody ever takes the startup screen out. Nobody ever does. So, but it, there's one in there. Uh, a lot of times, after a system's been up and running for a while, and they might be having trouble, we'll just say take the screen out. There's also a straightening vein inside to straighten the flow going into the pump. So if you don't have a long sweeping elbow or a lot of room, what is it, five or seven pipe diameters? Well, on a commercial on the suction side, it's eight pipe diameters. Yeah. So you want to you want to put a suction guide in there if you don't have that room. Okay, um, and then on the discharge side, because if we restrict the suction side of a pump, what can happen? Cavitation. Something called cavitation. Lack of net positive suction area. Exactly. And what is that? MPFA. That is lowering the suction side to the point where the water flashes to steam. We're starving that pump so it pulls a vacuum. That's what cavitation is. If you go below atmospheric pressure, that's also a source of air. If you got a mechanical system. Well, if you're leaking in through the seal, yeah. But cavitation can be nasty. It can, I've seen impellers that were just pitted, like somebody took a, a drill and just put little 16th inch holes in all over the impeller. And what happens is, as the water goes into the eye, it's a, it, the water's coming in, but then all of a sudden, the impeller imparts pressure to it. And then it goes from 1,600 times to one. And that's where the damage is. And that's where the noise is. It's condensing. It's not the steam that's killing it. It's the condensing. It's going to higher pressure. And it condenses from 1,600 to one. And it just takes humps of the impeller 
It just takes the brass right out of it. So, and if you ever heard of pump capitating, you know. It sounds like you're pumping marbles. Mm -hmm. Exactly what it sounds like. So if you hear that, put take that discharge valve, throttle it a little bit, see if it quiets down. If it quiets down, it's trying to pump more, more water than it's really designed for. Or there's a restriction on the suction side. Okay, cavitation is nasty. So what we do on the pumps, and we talked about this earlier, this is that throttling valve. It's called a Flowtrex valve. So it's uh, designed to be throttled, but it does. It also has a built-in check valve. So when you have two pumps, whether you use one as one run and one standby, if you don't put a check valve on the discharge of the two pumps, if this pump's on, that water's going to circulate through the other pump and cause it to turbine and, and rotate. You need check valves on both sides. So the flow track valve goes on the discharge side of the pump. It can throttle, you can meter, and it has a check valve portion to it. And then parallel and series. Series is this, pumping out of one pump into another. We can do multiple pumps. When you see pressure booster systems, they call it <coughs> vertical multi-stage pumps. That's basically what they're doing. They're just putting impeller on top of impeller. And they're increasing the pressure. Where, that way. where you will we, 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 A BMS or a vertical multi-stage pump is what you see now in pressure booster systems for buildings. Domestic they make them vertical, they make really huge ones horizontal. It's, you know, yeah, but but the. But I mean, where would we do you know high buildings? High buildings um, on steam condensate, high pressure steam condensate. So condensate return to a boiler, a boiler. house. Well, it could be a high pressure boiler right next to it. But not in a hydronic loop because you got. To there is no effect. Yeah. You don't need it. I mean, I, I've seen people put BMS and vertical multi stage in heating systems. You don't need them. That was those 50% of the engineers. Yeah. They're the one that knew they had that bad head. So, so we talk about series pumping. That's kind of what you would look like. When we talk about parallel pumping, that's what you would look like. One's pumping into another for series, and one's pumping with the other one in parallel. So in series, we double the head. In parallel, we double the flow, as long as the pipe size is correctly sized for that double flow, okay? And the worst thing in the world with pops is seals, and this is the cause of it. Don't blame my seal, don't blame the other guy's seal. This stuff is magnetic, it's gritty, and it just tears the living daylights out of seal. So, Again, that's cleaning. That's what it does to your hands. Oh, no, it's, it, you can't get it off your no. hands. So that's what kills pumps. Um, and it's also oh, killing your boilers. Dry. Instant dry hands. Your boilers, your controls, everything, you know, right. every, everything, your valves, whatever yeah. you're using. So to me, I, I preach about water cleaning water, water systems. Something else. But again, they never seem to get done. Guys, I've about watching. done my time way more than I should have. Appreciate every second of it, Steve. Oh, yeah. I want to thank you guys for your time, really. And no one left. No sec? Well, well, Kevin left. Oh, well, he, he oh, just man. died. <laughs> so, no, thank you for your time, guys. And, and it, it felt good to get back and teaching in front of people rather than sitting and looking at everybody falling asleep on their computers. It's been a long time since I've seen anybody cram that much heat transfer fluid for you. I talk way too fast. No, Oh, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. I hope you got something.